My name is Ransom Penny, as it says. Um, I'm from the BBC's uh, data, vi uh, data journalism team, uh, which is a unit that sits within our visual journalism unit. And in this section, I'm going to be talking about our approach to uh, data journalism at the BBC. Uh, so you might be wondering, what is uh, data journalism? I hope not. Uh, it's basically storytelling uh, with data as, as a source. And uh, just going back to uh, about my team, uh, we are basically a team that brings together a mix of different disciplines. Um, I, I would say we are grouped in under statistics, journalism, computer science, and graphics design, all working for the same ultimate goal, which is uh, journalism. Data journalism is still journalism, and it's still storytelling. And ultimately, it's all about the story. Everything we do, it's about uh, telling stories. And it's, it might sound like it's a new thing, uh, as much as we have um, the new data science. But journalists have been t telling stories from data uh, for over 100 years. And um, we see a rise in, um, more recently, uh, data journalism. And that's largely due to um, data sets being available in the public domain. And also uh, the availability of uh, tools that journalists can actually use to make sense of data uh, becoming more available uh, to them to use. And this, all these tools are coming from mostly the uh, data science space. As a team, uh, we see ourselves as the bridge between uh, data in the world and uh, our audiences. Uh, basically, extracting the stories from within the data uh, for our audiences. Uh, we, 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 our, our, our role is to um, extract the data uh, and uh, extract meaningful uh, meaning and sense out of it through uh, informed analysis. And as part of our workflow, uh, as has been alluded in, an, an, in a previous talk, we also make sure that uh, before we go out with our findings, we confirm with uh, industry experts. And um, in some cases, in most cases, uh, the people who would have um, made the data available just for us to make sure that we understand what's in the data and also making sure that um, what we are, our conclusions from our analysis are as sound as we uh, think they are and also we are not holding any uh, biases at all. And then uh, we go and uh, tell the story. There are many ways in um, or formats that we use for storytelling. And uh, for us, especially when we are dealing with uh, data-heavy uh, stories, we want to make the stories personal. We want the people to um, put themselves in the story uh, so that they know what the implications of um, the numbers are for them as a, as a person. Also, we know that uh, putting people in, into the story makes them more engaged because they can actually relate to uh, what, we are, what we are telling them. In an example that I will be sharing um, in, a, in a little bit, um, we, we, we'll see uh, some of our learnings, which uh, was how uh, the NHS under pressure uh, most uh, trust in the NHS are actually failing to meet uh, set, set uh, targets by governments in their uh, respective nations. And in telling that particular story, um, we wanted to uh, let the user know what that implies in relation to them and their local NHS trust. How is it doing for them? How, would that, uh, how is that likely to impact them? And it's it's not always about shiny graphics. Yes, we do have uh, shiny graphics at, some, at, 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 at times, but there are instances where all that elaborate analysis boils down to a single fact or a single number in embedded in a new story. 
I'm going to uh, just show you a couple of um, uh, projects in the int interest of time uh, that we have uh, recently worked on. Uh, actually, both these projects, um, we released them uh, earlier this week, the house prices on Tuesday and NHS Tracker on Wednesday. And so basically with the first one, uh, our aim was to help people understand how house prices have changed uh, in their local, local area in the last decade. So we're looking at um, data between 2007 and 2017. And we probably know this particular story from the angle of house prices are increasing everywhere, but is it the story, is it the true story everywhere? especially when you take uh, inflation into account, which would reflect the reality, actually. Uh, does anyone want to give me um, their postcode and then I can tell you what's going on in your area? <laughs> CR0. So what we do is we are asking, uh, because we're telling the story at what level, uh, if I was to ask you what ward are you in? Interesting. But many people don't actually know what their words are. Actually, by show of hands, does anyone who knows what, what they're in? Go on. Yeah, not many people. So CR0. Six QT. So we asked the user to put in their postcode. So the idea here is... Um, <laughs> We wanted to uh, tell people, um, obviously, what the median house price in their area currently is. Uh, and area, we're talking of uh, their ward. And actually, he, he got his ward right. And uh, also, um, how that's changed over time um, uh, in, in, the, in the last decade. And I mean, one of our top findings was uh, in 58% of the wards in England and Wales, uh, house prices have actually gone down uh, when you take inflation into account. And then we also tell uh, you um, in comparison to uh, the most expensive and least expensive area in, in, the, in the country, how um, um, y it compares, like you can buy nine houses in Middlesbrough if you fancy. Um, and then the second um, project I am going to talk about uh, is the NHS tracker. Uh, which is obviously something that raises emotions with people. Um, in here, we um, governments in uh, England, Wales, Northern Ireland, and Scotland have set targets for um, NHS trust to uh, for for services uh, towards um, A and E, waiting times, cancer care, and uh, operations um, waiting times. And uh, basically, we wants people to be able to track how their local uh, trust is doing. Again, we um, save you the effort of knowing what your trust is by um, letting you uh, make use of your postcode. I'm going to use your postcode again. Um, CR0, is it four, six? Yeah. And if you are in England, you get a list of the three that are closest to you and you can choose one. Obviously, you might want to go back again to uh, uh, select another one. Keep doing this. this is what I was expecting. Anyway, so um, at the top there, we've got some scorecards that uh, shows that uh, his particular trust is not doing so well against the target for uh, a and &E waiting times. And cancer care and plant operations, great. And further down, um, we actually show the actual figures 90% uh, against the England average. And then, actually, in compared to other trusts in the country, where do you sit? Uh, you get to see that as well. So it's not that bad for, for in, in your trust. And uh, how it ranks, um, just looking at the raw figures, in uh, performance figures, basically. And also, the last time uh, your trust hit the target, uh, in this case, November 2015, uh, versus the England average of um, um, uh, July 2015. And we do the same for uh, the other 
uh, the other um, uh, services. Uh, we yeah. use data that's uh, publicly available. Uh, we use data from a, uh, uh, APIs. Uh, in some cases, we scrape data uh, from websites where we don't have access to APIs, but that's done uh, in collaboration with uh, the owners of uh, those websites. We make sure that they actually are aware. And we also make use of uh, freedom of information requests. Uh, we have a team in the BBC that specializes in that. As a data team, we do have uh, face challenges. Um, uh, as you can probably imagine, um, uh, historically, um, newsrooms are Excel based and uh, that has a challenge of uh, reproduci reproducibility of analysis. Uh, but we are migrating towards more uh, scripted solutions uh, using Python, using R uh, for as part of our workflow. But obviously that in introduces a challenge of uh, teaching or uh, um, journalists to uh, be able to be using uh, those tools. And I think that's something that we are doing quite um, efficiently. And uh, data volumes, uh, for the NHS Tracker project I showed just now, uh, we actually put together about 360 odd spreadsheets. And uh, you can imagine the uh, challenge that poses uh, as far as data wrangling is concerned. Um, so obviously a tool like IDA could actually help us uh, to, 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 to this end. And um, data unavailability. Um, for the house price project, we actually wanted to tell the story uh, for all the nations, the UK nations. But we couldn't do that for Northern Ireland and Scotland because the land registry only makes available the data f uh, into the open for um, England and Wales, like that's their coverage. Um, it's not available. Um, free of charge for uh, Scotland and uh, Northern Ireland. And also consistency. Um, with, as the BBC, we are a trusted organization and obviously everything that we make public uh, or that we publish um, has to be held to account as well, in a way, um, in that we have to be factually correct. So as part of our workflow, we have to um, make sure that uh, we are in liaison with um, um, uh, experts and other authorities um, uh, for the last two projects, uh, or the NHS project. We were in constant uh, touch with um, NHS England or, and uh, NHS Scotland, and I mean the different ones for the different nations, uh, telling them what we were finding and whether that was still in line with um, what they had uh, discovered themselves as part of their reports. Not so that we can uh, fiddle with the results, but so that we know that we're actually doing things uh, the right way. And um, I'm just gonna hand over to my colleagues to talk about um, data science. Thanks, Vincent. Yay. <laughs> My name's Jeremy, Jeremy Tarling, um, and I work for a team called um, Audience Engagement in BBC News. And uh, my talk's um, with a slightly different focus to Ransom's. It's about how we provide data internally to journalists working in the BBC Newsroom, um, rather than kind of audience-facing stuff. Um, oh, there we go, that looks familiar. Um, so um, it's audience engagement for us is, is, is a kind of an experiment, really. It's, it's a team that we set up about um, two years ago, um, and we are, uh, initially we were three people, um, that's a tweet from my boss being all excited about the fact that we have a software engineer within the BBC newsroom, you know that kind of big fishbowl that you see behind the, the anchors on the 10 o'clock news, um, that's that's where we sit, that's, I don't know if any of you ever seen um, Chris Wiggins, a New York Times uh, data scientist, talk about the org chart of the New York Times, and he just draws two boxes, church and state. And 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 BBCs like that, and probably most you know uh, newsrooms are like news organisations are like that, uh, and so we're we're kind of on the state side, and so putting us down there in the middle of that room, surrounded by journalists, was 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 an adventure. Um, and our job really is to try and inject some data into the editorial process, in, into the thinking that journalists are doing throughout the course of the day, which starts very early. Obviously, you know they huddle around six thirty in the morning, look at today's running order, look at the things that are going to be covered, and then move through the day, producing content, gathering content, feeds coming into the building, 
editing, reorganizing, uh, sometimes changing the line that we're taking as the story develops. Uh, and, and, and our job was to try and make sure that audience data and the way that that story is being consumed by the audience and sort of shared and uh, covered elsewhere is being fed into that editorial thinking. Um, so yeah, that's, that was our mission statement, um, a culture of data-driven decision-making uh, to news editorial. So a lot of there's a lot of data there already. Um, you know, we have access to, to tools like Chartbeat, Comscore, uh, Adobe, since Comscore is now part of Adobe. Um, social media insights, search insights. You know, all the, all, all, the, all these things are available to journalists, but actually they're mostly focused on content creation, quite rightly, and not on learning how to use the latest analytics package or you know any of the sort of tediousness that goes with that. And so what my team does in a nutshell really is is, is to just pull data from all these disparate sources and present them back to journalists in a way that they can easily consume and, and understand. Um, also, that's, there's, there's a wider trend going on within the news publishing industry, I think, which is a move away from the sort of simple, what you might call the vanity metrics of like, you know, total number of browsers or total number of page views, and much more interest in things like engagement and time spent and what people are doing with your content rather than, you know, how many clicks did you get today? You know, how much, if we produce a piece of video online, how far through did people play before they got bored or did they share it afterwards? Or all that kind of stuff is, is increasingly important to us um, as a measure of, you know, the relevance of the BBC. Um, there's another kind of underlying agenda here, I think, which is that we know from our um, polling of, of the audience that um, BBC News is mostly consumed by people like me, white middle-aged males. Um, we have a problem with reach uh, in certain socio-economic uh, demographic groups. We have a problem with reach with women, and we have a problem with reach with uh, with, with younger women particularly. That's what that that um, that graph represents. So, green is the sort of audience that we're super serving, um, and red is 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 the audience who uh, we're reaching least. This is based on asking uh, how often you uh, consume BBC News in some form. So it could be watching the 10 o'clock news on TV, could be using the app on your phone, that kind of stuff. And so our, our I think at least part of our mission is to, is to try and help journalists think about how their content is gonna reach those underserved audiences as well. So there's, there's two sides to that. The, the, the easy stuff I've called here, which is you know just a sort of pulling data out of APIs and databases and presenting it in a user-friendly way. And I'm gonna show a couple of examples of that in a sec. Um, then there's increasingly, I think, we're becoming um, conscious of some more interesting stuff that we can do with audience data. And, and, and Magda's gonna talk about that a bit in, in, in her talk after me. Um, but it's in, in terms of understanding the audience, you know, you, you can't get too far with just um, high level metrics like page views and visits and browsers. You need to know a little bit more about your content and a little bit more about your audience to, 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 to really understand. So this was the first thing we built. This is just, you know, most watched, most searched, most shared for. But the, the important thing here is so far today. So, you know, journalists for a long time have been able to log into an analytics tool and create a report and look back at news consumption over the past seven days. But this was just a way of seeing what's happening so far this morning. Um, and, and, you know, what's being shared most, what's being um, searched for most and on, on, on Google and how our content's performing in ag against those contexts. And after producing that, we found um, that was kind of like an icebreaker within the newsroom. So journalists would start to come over to me and, and, and my colleague Dan and, 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 and Robin sort of ask, how's my stuff doing? You know, the thing I just produced, you know, is it getting much traction on Facebook? You know, is it, is it being picked up through search? That kind of stuff. So the second thing we produced, and this is in active production at the moment, is, is, is a, uh, a dashboard that we've called Telescope for some reason. It, it doesn't have anything to do with astronomy particularly, but you have to call things things these days, don't you? Um, and it's uh, a way of looking in, in, in greater detail at the individual performance of, of a, piece of, a piece of news content. So um, one of the things that we're particularly interested in at the moment is the idea of um, the impact that an action taken by a journalist had on a story. So those, sorry, it's a bit hard to read, but the, the, these red boxes here, um, these are showing um, actions taken. So it could be the rewriting of a headline, for example, to uh, make a story pick up some, some traction. Um, let me give you an example. So Ransom showed um, the NHS um, piece of visual journalism that, that we produced, um, which is really popular, but at the same time, if people are, you know, if we were to look, are people coming into that from search and from social? Maybe not, you know. Um, and so what could we do to sort of hook into to that potential audience rather than the kind of loyal B 
BBC audience who come and visit us every day, you know, people like me. Um, how, how can we aid the, the, the discovery of that piece of content? So we might look for um, stories about the NHS that are trending in the news today and then maybe hook what we've done uh, in, into that story. So if there's a particular story about a hospital today, for example, we might rewrite the headline of, of the work that Ransom's team have done and sort of say, you know, see how that compares to, the, to, to these other hospitals or to your area, those kinds of things, you know. Uh, and so these 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 ideas here are at, um, the, the kind of data points, if you like. They're they're events taken by a journalist, um, or, or, or steps taken by a journalist, actions taken by a journalist, and then the resulting impact it had on things like search referrals, social referrals. Um, sometimes it's things like promotion and placement. So it could be that we bumped it up a, a notch or two on the on the on the BBC News front page, and that can always have a big impact on on on, on traffic. Um, and then la last last graph I'm going to show you. This is um, another thing that my team does, um, which is kind of less interesting to me, but very interesting to my boss. Is 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 sort of tracking our um, performance over time. Uh, so this is looking at world service particularly, and we have some really crazy targets around reaching 500 million people globally with all the different language services that the BBC produces. As you can see, we're some way off that at the moment, at about 32 million browsers last week or the week before. Um, but the the idea is to um, track over time to see if the actions that we're taking in, in this kind of micro level within the newsroom and working closely with journalists is actually impacting our reach over time. Basically, if the team, if the experiment of creating an audience engagement team is working, you know, are we, are we doing our job? Um, and, and yeah, uh, so, so far, um, it's pretty flat, actually. Um, so, uh, ch challenges ahead. Um, this, this, <laughs> this is my, uh, yeah, uh, this, is, this isn't being recorded, is it? No. Yes. Damn. Um, so, yeah, this is my last slide. Um, th there are still some things that we, we, we need to sort out, I think, in terms of our own data. Um, we, we're still quite bad at uh, knowing who our audience is. So uh, that, that slide I showed with the kind of uh, age, gender, socioeconomic stuff, that was based on going out and polling a thousand people. That's not based on actual data, which we'd much rather because we have the, capa the capability to crunch big data sets. But getting data with those sorts of information is, is difficult. It's gradually starting to change. So some of you will have, if any of you use iPlayer, you'll have noticed that you have to log in to use iPlayer nowadays. And when you log in, you create an account on BBC, a BBC ID. And I think we ask you for your date of birth and your gender and your town or location or something like that. And that's really because those three data points that can, can uh, assuming that between watching last night's EastEnders and then flicking across to uh, read today's news headlines, you don't log out we can start to see for the first time, you know, things like reach for gender for the news audience and so on. Um, we're really bad at counting video and particularly how far through videos people play. This is due to our own technical uh, constraints, I think. But also, this is hard for other people. Remember when Facebook announced last year that they were doubling the amount of time spent on video accidentally? Um, and finally, uh, I think those two those two bullet points are sort of wrapped in together, really. Um, we're still a very small team and I look with envy at, you know, the size of the... Of the data science or, or data analytics teams in the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Guardian. Um, and we've grown a little bit, you know, we were three and we're now eight. Um, and, you know, if, uh, if I was a startup, I'd probably think that's slightly too fast to grow in two years. But still, um, I think we're, you know, we've made some good progress, but we're still quite um, a sort of modest investment by BBC standards compared to, compared to what some of our competitors have done. And I think the impact of that is that when my boss meets with his peer, his peers and the and, 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 and the uh, you know senior management part of the BBC and decide our strategy going forward, I'm still not convinced that data is right in there at the moment and is driving a lot of those decisions as much as it as it might be. That's me. Right, I'm going to hand over to Magda now, who's going to talk a bit more detail about data science. Thanks, Jeremy. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is. Magda, uh, I'm sorry, I have another error, doesn't it? Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a new creation at the BBC Newsroom, and that's a data science um, team. Um, we, um, I think the, um, the general purpose of, of putting data scientists in the newsroom is um, is also about making the news more personal to the user, but it's kind of a making it a little bit in a more seamless way. So um, I think the, the products that we talk about 
or we're trying to build are working a little bit more on the back end and, and the kind of a backstage of the BBC News. So um, Jeremy is taking data and giving it to journalists so they can actually take some actions based on the data. Um, Ransom is taking some data from the public and then delivers it to the public in some form of an interesting stories. What we are doing is taking the data from the BBC kind of a backstage and then using it as a um, to build machines that are driving the, the product to make the news much more personal to, um, to the audience. Uh, and um, I think one of the reasons what uh, that, that we are um, found our ways to, to the newsroom as data scientists is that the, the data was always, always there and, and people were always talking about audiences um, and so on. But because of the current technologies of how we can track and record data um, about the audience or about the content, um, it's, it's much bigger now. So um, uh, I think um, and that's kind of a why it's bigger. We're not kind of a publishing in the, in the form of that newspaper. We're now publishing to the millions and millions of, of users in forms of apps and websites and, and tools and, and, and so on. So the, the way we communicate has changed dramatically and um, that kind of a digital, uh, digital world has offered um, a lot of ways to, uh, to record more data. Um, and therefore, um, I think the, uh, the need for data scientists has, um, has appeared, or kind of a data scientists have spotted quite a nice opportunity to get into the, um, uh, into the newsroom. Um, but I think there is one thing about um, all that, that big data and playing with data and making you know, amazing stuff and building robots and, and so on. But the, the reality, um, um, especially in places like BBC, is that our job is really to, to bridge that gap between what is technically possible today um, and what is uh, practical for, uh, for the audience to, uh, to do and what is practical for our journalists to, um, for us to do. To how, how can we help them uh, to be better? And I'm going to kind of uh, try to show a few examples um, of that. So and I think especially in this institute, it's, it's fair to say that uh, it is quite technically possible that we can probably, um, a big share of the news could be generated in a, in a robotic way. Uh, and I think there's a lot of voices that would say that, you know, over the next few years, that, that is what's going to happen. <coughs> However, we are still quite lost in what we, what we create on our own. So I think there is this practicality of, well, you know, is it fake, is it real, is it factual, is it not, um, and the actual te technical possibility, and I think our job is to, to link the two. Uh, so first thing that we are actually um, doing a lot is trying to assess um, whether the data that we already have is actually enough, and it's actually the right set of data, and th this is a snapshot of of our data about content that is annotated manually by journalists. And as you can see, this is not great data because all we know here is that most of the articles are about Donald Trump and about US and about all those big topics of Brexit. So that doesn't really, it is not very helpful uh, for us to, uh, to use it um, as, a, as a driving force behind the website or behind the recommenders or anything that is driving the product and therefore um, techniques like um, natural language processing and entity extractions uh, uh, kind of found their way to the newsroom as well because that helps us understand a little bit more about what we are actually uh, producing what our content is about and that's one of the fundamental data sets that we use to um, to, to build the kind of the machines behind them the news. The other side, as I mentioned before, is that kind of a original thought about the audience and how can we understand what people like, what people read, what people engage with and, and so on. And some of that data is displayed in the form of in the telescope and is directly translated into some metrics and, and then um, surfaced to, to the journalist, but some of it is just used, used to, to create algorithms. Uh, but the, the audience data um, wasn't, um, it's, it's nothing, nothing new. I mean, you know, from the beginning of entertainment, people were clapping and cheering and shouting and throwing stuff at people and, 
Um, and that was a kind of an anecdotal uh, way of um, expressing and measuring the, the impact of the, um, of the um, show or of the um, uh, created content. Uh, then we kind of uh, moved into some kind of a more surveyed um, and rating based measurement. And we still, a lot of that still is, is collected like this. Um, kind of a TV and broadcasting data is still based on the, on the surveys. Um, as James mentioned, the demographic data is, is based on the surveys. Uh, but um, in the pure digital, uh, digital world, we, we basically capture every single click and metadata related to that click. So that's a lot of data. Uh, and then we also create quite a lot of data ourselves. So, you know, the fact that uh, each click has two 250 dimensions and I have, s have it stored in, in, in our data lake, that's not so much good to explain to the journalists what are the audiences, who is actually reading the content. Um, so there therefore we, um, we use um, unsupervised methods like clustering to uh, create um, groupings of audiences and and describe them in a in a more kind of a uh, friendly way. Um, uh, so we would, uh, for example, have uh, different different segments of of readers who are reading our uh, our Mundo, our World Service Mundo, uh, and we know that there is a small group of BBC enthusiasts who are reading everything, uh, but there will be a big group of people who are not engaging with us uh, that much, and we need to make sure that they stay on our side a bit longer. Um, but um, there is, um, I think in the newsroom, and that comes back to that practicality, in the newsroom uh, there is no space for black boxes. Um, I think um, kind of that, that link between us and editorial is so close that we can't just say like, hey, you know, why don't we build this super robot uh, that's going to do everything for you? Uh, that's just not going to fly. Um, so sometimes it's about simple solutions and somehow so sometimes it's about how can we start to take the, the news as a product on that journey of, of being more data driven. Um, and something what worth kind of a discussing and I think we have it, uh, we think about this a lot is that BBC, despite not being a commercial organization, it's still competing for the attention of the audience in the same way as anybody else. Um, so whether it's Telegraph or it's BBC News, they earn the money and they support and fund themselves in a different way, but the audience attention is what they are fighting for. So, so the, pressure, the pressures that we are facing is are exactly the same. And I think we need to, we need to act very fast uh, in order to get to that attention and keep the attention of the, of the audience. Um, and uh, and therefore there is no space to really you know kind of uh, go to the basement uh, spend there a few years and and come back with something amazing and that's going to work for for everybody we need to iteratively improve our product to make um, to make the the news better um so i think one of the big questions is um what can we do to basically make people read more um, and and also uh, the right audiences. Um, so you know, again, mentioned demographics. Um, how can we make uh, younger women read more of the BBC content? Um, so basically, the answer is very very uh, simple. Uh, we need to just deliver most relevant content uh, to the right user or to the right reader at the right place and the right time. Um, and I think this is the place where that seamless intrusion or seamless help of, of data and, and data science methods uh, takes, uh, takes place. So one of the first projects that we started to work on is uh, or our recommenders. Um, and again, with that kind of a principle of let's start practically, be practical and be simple and let's start with something so we can then test uh, and improve and iterate over this. Um, so we bas basically said that, well, Let's let's start with two very simple recommenders. Um, also, some might argue that most viewed or most popular is not a recommender, but I would argue that well, filtering top ten articles is a mathematical formula, and it is a recommender. Um, it's very simple, but um, it's still kind of delivering the 
the audience or the, the content that might be interested uh, interesting to the specific audience. Um, so we start very simple with the two types um, of recommenders, and then um, the the key to to move on is to embrace that concept, and that's something that kind of comes from more academic world as well. It's like we need to embrace experimentation and ability to to test online. So uh, we work with MVT tools and and release our products um, so that we can we can test how they really work in with with the real time um, or with, with the real audience um, and then kind of a move on to the next one um, so this is our envisaged kind of a evolution of the brain behind the, the website uh, we're starting simple then iterate and do the, the whole system the whole kind of uh, environment behind the site more and more complicated um, the other kind of a difference um, or the the reason why we are starting quite simple is that um, a lot of commercial commercially built uh, solutions that are existing in the market, uh, whether they are just off the shelf recommenders or uh, libraries in machine learning uh, that can be helpful for us, are designed specifically for a commercial environment, which might not necessarily be relevant to us because we fighting for the attention of the audience but not um, to uh, optimize the commercial revenue. Uh, what we would like to do is we would like to reach the audiences that are currently marginalized, that currently do not have access to the, um, to the news or to the independent news, and uh, that's across the globe and that's in the UK as well. So um, one of the key, key areas where we are spending quite a lot of uh, work and research and that's you know it's something that is open especially here in the in institute and and um, I'm pretty sure and there will be quite a few people interested in this is how can we reinvent our cost function so to optimize the kind of the robots that are driving our site and our news experience um, so that it optimizes for the right values um, so how do we program fairness, how do we program uh, diversity and uh, accessibility? And those are the kind of uh, questions and um, and kind of a math puzzles that we are trying to resolve. Um, so, but yeah, that's that's to say is that we need to start, we start in kind of, a we invent in that world for, for ourselves in, in a lot of cases because a lot of tools that are out there already are just not suitable for, for what we need. But the good news is that um, I think um, with all the practicalities that we are trying to, to bring to the newsroom and, and the closeness that we have in relationship with the journalists, um, I don't think there is any danger of AI replacing the journalists anytime soon. Uh, but it will definitely change the, the scope of the work. And I think the, some of the things that are currently taking time of the, of the journalists might not, might not uh, exist in the same for, uh, form as they are now in a uh, so-called data-driven newsroom. Thank you. I think we do have time for a couple of questions. Uh, lots of questions. <laughs> I'll start. Thank you. My name is Emily. I wanted to ask you, so in terms of the recommender, one of the problems is um, presenting a user with novel ideas. So what do you think is the importance of presenting a user with novel ideas when using that nearest na neighbor approach? Or conversely, what are the limitations of using that similarity approach? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that comes back to, first of all, that kind of the cost function that we're using. So it's important that novelty or serendipity is is programmed into our optimization metric uh, to to make sure that the recommender that we are launching is better than no recommendation version of the site or uh, some other recommenders. The other thing is that I think the key to this is about recognizing the needs of a specific audience, and that's why you know all those bubbles that we are, we were drawing and and the time spent on um, looking at different types of audiences helps us understand which of those bubbles of audiences are more likely to be interested in content that is more similar to the content that they landed on versus 
some other content that they d is a little bit more random or uh, new to them. They haven't seen it before. And I think we already have quite a lot of success and learnings in that particular uh, area. So we know that there is a group of people who are described by certain dimensions that are more looking to uh, in-depth knowledge about certain topic versus uh, people who are not, who just kind of uh, they're for maybe most popular or um, um, a little bit more random set of articles. I think it would be fun if, if you actually showed you might hate this article. <laughs> I mean, one of the one of the recommendations I always want to test is the random, gen r randomly generated articles, because I think you know some people would claim that it might work. But it all that's why it's the key is to MVT to test it and to see what is working for whom, um, for which audiences, because um, we can only hypothesize. So my question is actually almost a follow-up to that one. Um, I was wondering about two things. First of all, sort of this uh, third-party recommender algorithms uh, on social media, which also will pull audiences into certain articles based on you know everything from what's shared in their network to um, uh, what they may be interested in to you know black box full of metrics. And then I was also wondering. Um, Given the recent uh, social media company commitment, particularly from Facebook, that was quite public in the aftermath of the mm -hmm. US election about helping people to break out of their quote unquote bubble or echo chamber, how do you anticipate that playing with um, mm -hmm. or interacting with the algorithms that you're working with? Yeah. Um, so uh, the relationship that we have with the platforms with social media is getting closer and closer because obviously some of our our content is is published on Facebook, and uh, you know this is how we access our audiences. Um, again, I think I'm gonna come back to the key is to understand the need of that specific audience and maybe bring them closer to our native tools and our native apps, so they are kind of a not necessarily taking away because Facebook is a great way for us to uh, uh, for the audience to discover the content. Uh, but then we also want to bring them back and and stay in, in our environment and and then we can understand a little bit more about the audience um as for the kind of uh, eco chambers and and so on that's again comes back to the to the right metric i think we would like to parameterize uh, sorry introduce enough parameters in our system so that we can introduce a that kind of a novelty factor but it's all down to what we're trying to optimize for uh, and I think that kind of a cost function is going to help us reduce the impact of eco chambers and, and so on. I think we can do one more question while setting up for the next speaker. So. Um, my question is actually for Vansom. Yeah. Um, I I really like the product about the house prices. I think that's something that could be used um, as an extremely informative tool. But could you share on whether that ten like as a do you do you think it's a long term continuous project where you sort of update it and potentially develop it into a like long term sustainable information tool for people where they can compare um, how their house prices have changed, um, say in 2020. Um, in in reference to a certain point that they would like, say, at the point at which they acquired their property, because I think that would be um, far more useful rather than um, a tool that was only updated in 2010 and then reference to a particular point designed by the algorithm. So, is there um, such plans for this specific tool? And if that's and, and depending on that, do you see how, how do you see like these sort of data, bringing public data back to the public, these sort of products developing, do you think they would be um, for like specific points in time or do you think the BBC should move towards developing such long-term products? Yeah. Uh, so in response to the first question, which is, uh, is it long-term or are there plans for um, long-term republishing as it were? Um, there will be, I, I can't obviously commit to that, but um, we, are exploring um, um, re keeping that uh, ongoing, uh, such that people can actually make comparisons on different snapshots. But 
with such a story, uh, the challenge is it's not just about the actual tool, it's tool itself. There's also the narrative that wraps around uh, that tool, like the analysis that um, the journalist will uh, write about. But compared to something like the NHS, that's actually confirmed running for the next one year. Uh, so uh, yesterday we actually had data for Wales. Um, that's, that has gone into uh, the, the two, and in, in a month's time we'll be getting data for England, etc. So as there are data updates, that data will be going in, and um, what you see today won't necessarily be the same. And at those particular points, there will be stories supporting uh, what will be the story on that particular day or at that particular data publication. But yes, we are, as an organization, trying to move towards um, having more long-term uh, or rather longer life type projects f using data. <laughs>